to the identifying emergency. Good afternoon and welcome to the Identifying Emergency Funds and How to Advocate for Making Room in Your Financial Aid Workshop. Um, I'm pleased to be joined today by Paul Artali, Darlene Ray Johnson, Doreen Moraski, and Vicki Krepper, who are the real experts here. Um, thank you again for joining us on this Friday. I'm going to hand it off to Paul Artali to let you to uh, give you some insights into the financial literacy series and the partnership between Rackham and CEW. Thanks, Tiffany. Uh, my name is Paul Artali. I am the program manager for graduate student engagement here at Rackham. And thank you for coming today for today's session on identifying emergency funds and how to advocate for making room in your financial aid package. This series uh, comes out of a collaboration between the Rackham Graduate School and CEW Plus, based on overwhelming feedback we've received over the years on the importance of financial education to our students. Um, at all stages of their career uh, here. So um, this is another workshop. We have done past workshops in the past, everything from taxes to planning your budget. And those workshops are available virtually as well through CEW Plus and through the Rackham Graduate School. And so afterwards, we will definitely can provide you links to those. And for those that are joining us, this is also a joint event with, uh, this is also part of the Rackham, Rackham 101 series, which is a every Friday at 2 p.m., a series that is designed at giving students a essential resources, <laughs> tips, and strategies to be successful here at, uh, at, at graduate school. And with that, we are going to begin our presentation. I would like to have our presenters introduce themselves. And first, I'd like to call on my colleague, Darlene Ray Johnson from the Rackham Graduate School. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Darlene Ray Johnson, and my title is that of um, Rackham <laughs> Resolution Officer. And so I have oversight for um, resolution services for Rackham graduate students. Um, actually, I wear a couple of different hats within Rackham to include um, graduate student employee disability accommodation processes, um, working around sort of crisis management um, when those issues arise um, within our graduate student community. So there's a, a couple of different hats I wear, but with regard to today's presentation, um, I um, so one of our roles within the resolution office is to actually help sort of provide support and guidance to students who may have a need for some type of emergency fund or other kinds of resources um, on campus. Um, also, if any of you have gone to Rackham's um, emergency fund website, you may have seen my name listed there. And that's for a reason because sometimes the students need um, doesn't necessarily match the cr criteria that's listed um, on the website. And we don't want students to get discouraged. We encourage you to reach out to myself or a colleague in my office to learn um, what alternatives there might be. So with that, I'll stop. <laughs> Yeah, Doreen, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah. Sure, no. Um, my name is Doreen Moraski, and I'm the interim, interim associate director at CEW. Um, I work most closely with our counseling program and with student services and student programming in general. Um, I've been, I've worked at the university for a long time, and um, I know financial, having a financial solid base for students is so important to both their wellness um, and mental health, as well as their academic progress. And so part of what I echo what Darlene um, has just spoken is that our office um, wants to be there as a resource and a partner to help you navigate your way um, as students at the university. And I'm Vicki Krupper. I'm from the Office of Financial Aid. And my official role there is Senior Associate Director. But I work really closely with a number of our schools and colleges, CEW Plus, um, the Dean of Students Office, and a, a variety of other locations on campus for students who are experiencing some sort of emergency and need to try to figure out how they're going to fund that. So one of the, one of the hats that I wear. Yep, thank you. We'll go ahead and jump right in um, and provide you with a little bit of background information about how financial need is determined. Uh, Vicki, could you please um, explain uh, yeah. how? Yeah. Sure, and this is really critical to the, the first step, 
as you start to seek emergency funding, really understanding what's already being accounted for in your cost of attendance budget. So every student on campus has a cost of attendance, um, commonly referred to as a budget. And that cost of attendance will contain your tuition as being charged for your particular program and at your level of enrollment. So if you are full-time and in the flat fee rate, you will have that flat fee rate reflected as your tuition. If you are attending below the full-time rate, so you're being charged on a per credit hour basis, that will be the tuition that's reflected for you. We have all standard fees and standard fees are those fees that are charged to every single student on campus. So if you have a course fee, for example, that will not be in a cost of attendance because not every single student on campus will pay that exact same course fee because obviously you have to be in the course. Um, it will contain an allowance for books and supplies, an allowance for housing, and that will differ depending on being a graduate student or an undergraduate student. And then an allowance for personal and miscellaneous um, costs, things like deodorant and replacing your socks occasionally and, and those kinds of odd but important things that you need to have in order to be a student. As I said, that's every single student um, is going to have a cost of attendance and it will be the same for every student in the same program. So all art students will have the same cost of attendance other than reflecting in state or out of state tuition. Um, the family contribution is the next important piece to understand and that is determined for a graduate student by completing the FAFSA and for an undergraduate student will be a combination of the FAFSA and the CSS profile. That expected family contribution is calculated using the data that the family provides on those two forms, um, centering around the taxes paid for this year, it's 2018, the um, income earned for 2018, and any assets that may be in the family. The FAFSA does not include a home as, a, as an asset, but the CSS profile does. Um, and then to get to what you're eligible to receive in financial aid, you have to subtract that expected family contribution from the cost of attendance. The only thing that can offset the expected family contribution is either payments coming from your family um, that are paid directly to your student account or to you to help with rent, for example, off campus, um, or an unsubsidized loan or a private educational loan. Um, that includes a, pl a parent plus or a grad plus loan. You cannot use a scholarship or other um, free assistance coming from either internal or external to the university to offset that amount. And giving credit to Wichita, Wichita State for their lovely graphic, we don't have a graphic quite like this, but that is, it's an excellent explanation of how financial aid is determined. And how does financial need play into emergency funding? Oh, I'm sorry, I should have added that. So um, if you are a undergraduate Michigan resident, the university is committed to meeting your full need um, through a combination of any, any of the grants, scholarships, work, and or loans that are administered by the university. So um, you would have no remaining need should an emergency come up. Some of our non-resident undergraduate students also have similar packages where they have no unmet need. Some do have unmet need. And then graduate students are funded um, from our office only through loan assistance and through work. Most graduate students who only have those two types of aid are going to have need remaining after you subtract it, any aid um, that's available. But for grad students who are funded through a fellowship or a scholarship or a GSI position, for example, where tuition is covered and there's an additional stipend, in some cases, 
there will be no unmet need. So when we're looking at emergency funding, we often have to first look at expanding that cost of attendance to include whatever the emergency is. Um, so what's an emergency? An emergency might be something such as um, I needed to be transported, I had appendicitis and I needed to be transported to the hospital um, and I have an ambulance bill that I can't cover. It might be other medical expenses that are not being covered by insurance. It might be an emergency need to go home because my parents are ill and I need to get home to help care for them. Um, what an emergency is not, and that's it's a little bit easier to kind of explain what's not an emergency, is something that's a standard cost of attendance. So inability to pay for tuition is not going to be considered an emergency because that's something you always have to pay every semester of enrollment. So that's, that's a little bit of the dividing line. The other thing that financial aid cannot take into consideration for emergencies in most cases is going to be car maintenance. Um, you would need to have to have a program for you, have to have a car for your program in order for us to even consider car maintenance types of things, a flat tire, um, et cetera. And we cannot increase for car payments. So that's kind of emergencies in a brief nutshell. Mm -hmm. Darlene and Doreen, um, do you have anything to add to how emergency is defined? I believe it differs based on um, where a person is applying. Yes, I mean, for, for Rackham, it is um, an unanticipated, unexpected um, um, issue or event that occurs for a student. Um, I would have to agree with Vicki, though, if it is something that um, ordinarily would be a part of your sort of cost of attendance um, that you should anticipate, then we would not consider that an emergency. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll stop there for, for a second and let Doreen. Yeah, see. and I, I would agree um, with that as well. And what I would say is that over the years, because there's just so many amazing, unique circumstances that we all live through, um, that we've had students that come in that have a fire. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting things and difficult things that might come along um, that might constitute something unexpected. Do and I think that probably even gets to where we're going next is invite, like for CW, invite you to come in for a conversation so we can help you navigate that. Um, and maybe I'll just slide right into that um, as well. All, all the different offices that are that do have some funding available have a different way that you can access or apply for those funds. At CEW, um, it starts with a conversation of calling our office and now in these virtual times. Uh, to make an appointment, um, you call our office and then you're, um, you schedule an appointment with the counselor to either talk over the phone or through a, um, a, a virtual Zoom appointment and explore what's going on with you. Um, sometimes students will say they can't pay for their tuition, but we find out it's because they used their money for a dental procedure um, that was unexpected. And, um, and then we can say, well, the dental procedure actually is an unexpected emergency. Um, and not the rent that now you don't have money for now, but it's because something else came up. And that's what we often find is sometimes students are faced with some things that are kind of expected, but it's because there's some other emergent or urgent situation that happened. Um, and so that's again, something that, that we invite that conversation so we can help you figure that out. I think with COVID right now, there have been all kinds of different things that have come up with students. Um, with even some, some issues with employment that has been very difficult. Um, so again, inviting that conversation and figuring out what is going on for you and how we can best help is the best way. Yes, Darlene, what is the process through Rackham? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, Rackham Graduate School has an emergency fund. Um, so any Rackham student is eligible to apply. Um, there's a website dedicated to the emergency fund and our emergency fund application is listed there. 
Um, it outlines sort of eligible um, and ineligible expenses. So um, I think Vicki alluded to sort of medical emergencies. So an emergency root canal or an emergency visit to the hospital. Um, in most cases, those are eligible expenses. Um, you'll also see listed there things that are not eligible. So for example, um, rent, you know, car repair. Um, the emergency fund will not, um, an, an ineligible expense would be the purchase of a new laptop to replace the damaged um, um, or um, broken laptop. So, so those are, you know, just some of the um, um, issues that, but I, I want to go back and say, we recognize that for a lot of our graduate students, um, you are on a fixed income. And so almost everything probably feels like an emergency. And so um, again, I would encourage you to either apply to go to the emergency fund application and apply um, and or contact my office. If you have a question about your particular um, set of circumstances or um, needed expense to, and then what I can do is either help you understand um, what is eligible and what is not eligible and or how to craft your application in a way that is more likely to meet eligibility. Um, I can't guarantee that in all cases, but certainly, you know, there are certain things that we can talk about. There are certain circumstances, you know, as well. Um, you know, we talked about car repair, for example. But, you know, if you have um, a practicum, you know, in Detroit or in Jackson, and so you have to rely on that automobile to get back and forth, um, then that may be an eligible expense. So it's just those kinds of nuances that a student may not be aware of that my office can, can assist with. I'd also um, like to say that um, PhD students are eligible to up to, for up to two um, Rackham Awards during their tenure as a graduate student. Master students are eligible for one. And um, the, the cap um, on the award is $2,500. We have plenty of students who request funds, you know, less than that. Occasionally we have students who request more than that, but um, usually the cap is around $2,500 um, for students. With regard to, I mentioned rent, um, and I meant to mention childcare if I did not. Um, those are not typically eligible expenses. However, we would not want any of our students um, to be evicted and out on the street. And so if there is an issue with, um, you know, you're, you have an arrear, you're in arrears with your rent payment, um, I would definitely encourage you to come and have a conversation um, with me so that we can help sort of figure out, um, you know, how to move forward. There's also a number of students who um, either come to me and or apply on behalf of family members. And so I want you to know that your immediate family who resides with you um, are eligible. So for example, if you have a son or daughter who needed some kind of emergency procedure um, or your, your um, significant other partner, spouse, um, needed some kind of treatment, um, you certainly could apply to Rackham Emergency Funds um, for assistance with that. If it's a family member who does not reside with you, we have plenty of students who says, you know, my family, they're in California, but my mom is out of work, my dad is ill, so they have no income. Um, and I'd like to apply, you know, for $2,500 to send to my parents, you know, we, we are not able to do that. Um, our, you know, our funds are limited. We're trying to support as many of our graduate students as possible. And so we do limit awards for um, Rackham graduate student use only. Um, but if you do have those set of circumstances, you know, involving family members who don't necessarily re reside with you, I do encourage you to come and talk with me and we'll have a conversation about, you know, what um, alternatives think there may be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Vicki, in addition to rent. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
Well, I, I wanted to jump in before we move on to other resources really quickly, just to say that this mm -hmm. is where some of the conflict can actually, or confusion can arise when students are being approved for funding through their particular school or college, whether that's Rackham or LSNA or even CEW, when there's no room in their budget for that, for that assistance, because there are some things, if you have federal student aid, that we are not allowed to include in that cost of attendance. And one of those things, unfortunately, is support of family members. So we can include the cost of childcare, but we cannot include anything else. So if your spouse becomes ill, we are unable to add to the cost of attendance for that. So that's where the conversations are really important because we start to look at, okay, we can't do that, but what else can we do to try to look around that budget um, to see what else we might be able to, to expand. Um, for example, is your rent more expensive than what we have in the standard cost so that we can work cooperatively with your school and college to help you get the, the funding that you need. It may just be handled a little differently than, <laughs> than the way that was expressed. Um, in terms of other places around campus where there are emergency assistance, almost every school and college has at least a small fund available to, um, to their students for emergencies. And because of the size differential at schools, some may limit their assistance to $250. Some may be able to be a bit more expansive and go a bit higher with the, um, with the emergency that they can assist with. So it really will depend on your school or college. Mm -hmm. um, the Dean of Students Office is also a great place to head. Um, what's great about working with Darlene's office, what's um, working with CEW Plus and with the Dean of Students Office is that we have a really good relationship among us. And so we can have some of that conversation behind the scenes to determine how and what documentation might be necessary in order to expand the budget before you have to navigate that. Um, so those are all great places to, to head. Um, yeah. And then I don't want to leave us out. We also um, in the financial aid office do have some emergency assistance that is available um, coming from, from donors who have provided a limited funding for certain circumstances. So if you're not finding anything in your school or college with CEW, with Dean of Students, um, it, it's always good to have a conversation with us as well. Um, and we'll get to how you can best advocate for funding in, in a moment, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Vicki, how does this all relate yeah. to CARES funding? Um, great. Yeah, I should have mentioned CARES. I'm sorry. So um, there is on every eligible student panel in the student center, I believe. Um, but when you log on to your Wolverine Access student portal, there is a tile that says, um, COVID-19 emergency funding assistance. And if you click on that, it will direct you on the navigational path to get to the actual application. Um, COVID-19 funding is primarily being supported through the Federal CARES Act and the money that was given to the university to support students. We received 12.5 million. We have currently spent um, just under 10 million of that. Uh, we do report every 45 days on the university's dashboard with our expenditures. Uh, we will look at all types of assistance that is, um, is needed because there has been some sort of COVID related disruption. So mom and dad lost a job and now they can't help me pay for rent, even though rent would normally not be an emergency thing that we would look at in this particular circumstance, we would. Um, food insecurity is another area that we can provide assistance with. Technological needs, um, I now need a webcam because I'm Zooming a whole lot more. Um, we can help support that request. So we encourage every student who, if you have not already done so, to go ahead and fill out that application. Just be aware that there is a large volume of them coming in. So um, it, does, it does take a minute for us to go through them and it, it may be up to 20 days before you actually receive a response on that. Um, but that's another way to secure some additional emergency funding. We also are 
working cooperatively with some of the other schools and colleges. So um, Rackham has been wonderful, actually, um, for our inter particularly for our international students who do not qualify for the federal CARES funding. They have set aside some dedicated funding to assist with uh, food insecurity, with some child care issues. Um, so we've been working with them very closely to um, to award Rackham international students who have been unable to qualify in other ways for funding. We've also been working with CEW and with the Dean of Students Office. Um, CEW provided a great deal of funding for food insecurity. So um, that's, it's a great way, even if you think that you may not be eligible for CARES funding, please go ahead and fill that application out so that we can try to route you to the appropriate resource that might be able to assist you. Vicki, do you want to say anything about the um, child care subsidy? What would you like me to say? <laughs> <laughs> the, well, that, that, this is a moving target right now because of the negotiations that are going on with the scenario. Ah. So, but um, what I can say is that currently students who have um, children in a licensed daycare facility can apply for the formal University of Michigan Child Care Subsidy Program. That application is available through our website. If you have any questions on how to access it, just um, give us a call or send us an email and we'll, we'll provide that URL for you. Um, for students who are not using licensed care, but let me, let me go back a minute. Licensed care is also expanded um, because of the COVID situation and so many students working remotely to licensed care in other states and not just within the state of Michigan if you happen to be a remote student. For students who are not using licensed care, we are providing up to $1,200 through the CARES funding to assist with that. Um, that all could change. So, um, we hope that um, that something will come soon of the negotiation that are going on with the GAO so that we have some clarity in what's allowable and what's not. Um, but right now the funding for unlicensed care is through CARES funding. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to say one more thing about Rackham's Emergency Fund. You know, for students applying um, for emergency funds, that um, the, the criteria is not real, real clear in the application, but to help expedite um, the processing and approval process of your application, we ask that you um, include a budget. So we, we want to know what your expenses are currently. And then we also need to know what your income is. And so um, what we're looking for is a gap, right? And, but, and so some students, it's just not very clear on our website. So I just wanted to be sure to share that. Um, and it takes usually about seven days, seven to eight days in order from the time that you submit your application to the time of its approval and the funds are actually dispersed. Yeah. And then the other thing I did want to say, it's been mentioned, but I wanted to make sure it was very clear is that part of what we've been trying to do across campus is we realize it's such a decentralized campus and that there's many people that you may be in contact to reach out for funding, but we are trying to work in partnership um, across campus too that so wherever a student shows up um, that we can try to see if we can navigate and help them out um, so they don't have to go to repeated offices uh, to, to continually tell their, their story, which often it's very difficult when you come in seeking uh, financial um, assistance and find yourself in a spot. So we're, we're trying to do that as well. And the other thing I can say is sometimes students have gone to financial aid first, um, but financial aid, but they maybe not feel comfortable talking about really some of the details of what's causing them to be um, having some kind of uh, financial insecurity. Um, and so often again, sometimes that we can just help find out what it is so that we really can then help you figure out what is the language and what you need to sort of put forward so that you can be successful in getting some funding to help you through emerging needs. Yeah, we have a student who asked about um, non-Rackham international students. Are there avenues for them to receive emergency funding? Those avenues are going to be primarily through places like CEW Plus, 
through um, your individual schools and colleges and a bit through the Dean of Students offices. Um, beyond that, unfortunately, funding for international students is, is really, really limited and you're not eligible through the CARES funding that um, was limited to US citizens. So the best route to start at would be your individual school or college. I would also say inquire at the International Center. Um, it's not a lot of money, but they may have, a, they may be able to help a little bit. And so I wouldn't rule out checking with the International Center as well. And then I can say some of, some of this too is I, I feel like there's, there's some things that we would like to do, but sometimes our hands are just tied following federal regulations. And so that's part of what we're very careful about in terms of making sure that if we provide you some kind of aid in one place, it doesn't mess up aid in another place. So that's why it's so important for us to work really closely with financial aid to make sure that what we're doing and that you truly are getting additional funds versus it taking it away from funds from another area. Yeah, yeah. could you describe, I know um, there's often hesitancy when entering into a new experience. Um, it helps to know what to expect what might a student experience when applying for emergency funds as far as timeline, who they might contact, what types of information will be requested? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I jumped the gun, I'm sorry, Tiffany, and, and shared <laughs> that, <laughs> that um, you know, for Rackham emergency funds that, you know, once a student applies um, and the more information and documentation that you can share, um, during the application process, I think the better. That will help expedite the review process. But uh, just in terms of, if you're not sure if Rackham Emergency Funds is, is the right place to start um, with your concern, I would say, you know, please reach out. Um, we, can, we can schedule a meeting. We can have a Zoom meeting or a phone conversation to just really talk about what's going on. Now, um, my office doesn't have the same confidentiality as, say, I, CAPS, our CAPS counselor, but we don't share anything with anyone without getting your permission first. So students do feel a little bit more um, free and comfortable sharing more personal information, um, you know, with my office. And then we can really figure out where the resources might be located. It might be Rackham, it might be a cost share situation as Doreen indicated, you know, across campus um, to help make the student whole in terms of their um, request or need. Yeah, I would say what you might um, experience when applying um, through funds for our office is that we're going to listen um, and hear what's going on and um, again, with uh, knowing a little bit more about um, some of the campus resources and maybe some of the community resources um, that we may be able to, to, to point you in the right direction if we can't help you ourselves. Um, oftentimes, as, as others have talked about, is that we need to reach out first to um, even financial aid to find out what are some of the behind the scenes that sometimes students might not be able to even to see in their own packaging um, to make sure or sort of, you know, figure out what's going on. Um, and what, what Darlene had talked about too is really coming with kind of a clear sense of where, where, what, what's coming in the door and what are some of the expenses that you're not able to, to um, navigate and manage. Um, and for, for most of the expenses in our office as well, we just need documentation so that we have that on file in terms of being good stewards of the funding that we do have to sort of document where it's going to. Um, and then we do try to keep track. Also, one of the things I would say is that we do try to take this information collectively and feed it up the chain so even our leaders at the institution understand where students are experiencing um, some of the critical financial um, issues that they're dealing with. Um, so really, can we can inform that upward as well as trying to help you personally. Yeah, thank you. So, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think you got this. So. <laughs> <laughs> as, I, as I jump ahead of you. Um, so this, this is the, the area where um, I really want you to, to help under, want to help you understand how you can be your own best advocate in this area. 
So for students who have a standard financial aid package that fully meets their quote unquote need and an emergency comes up, we really need to help understand what that emergency is. And as Darlene just mentioned, um, sometimes, um, and maybe Doreen also mentioned this, that sometimes students aren't as comfortable in an office that feels maybe more institutional with sharing what's going on with, with their lives and why an emergency need has come up. So sometimes it's a little easier to say, my grandmother died and I need to get home, and not as easy to say, I have a mental health issue and I need my medication and I can't afford it. But we need to, to, to understand really what's happening with you and why you have this emergency need. So we need you to, to be as forthcoming as you can um, and to please um, to share as much as you can with the aid officer. We also are operating in a virtual environment right now. So um, we're seeing a lot of questions come in through email and it's really hard I think to express emergency needs through an email message. Things get misunderstood or you mistype a word and, and said, uh, didn't add a knot in there or you know something that really can change the thrust of the conversation. So I would really recommend that if you have an emergency need in this virtual environment that you um, request a virtual appointment with us. If you, um, once we return to hopefully soon a normal um, environment, then come in and actually speak with someone so that we can better understand what's going on. As you're working with other advocates across campus, that's also important because they're going to share that information with us. The key is going to be documentation. So um, a student who is seeking, for example, um, assistance with an emergency room bell getting that documentation, showing the bill, providing the bill so that we have the documentation. Our office is audited on an annual basis because we do administer so many federal funds. And as a part of that requirement, they audit to make sure that we are following federal policy and policy requires documentation. So that's gonna be key first. Um, also providing a clear, narrative of what's happening so that again um, when an auditor looks at a decision that we've made to increase the cost of attendance or ourselves provide funding that an auditor isn't going to have to ask why did you make this decision that it's very clear from the materials that are available um, if you're not clear you're not comfortable talking with our office and you prefer to work through one of the offices that are a bit more um, student approachable maybe and don't don't feel quite so institutional we will work very closely if you give permission to do that with the dean of students office with cew plus with each of the school and college um, scholarship offices with doreen's of, um, darlene's office we we have quite a few conversations back and forth with um, those areas to uh, try to get at what really is going on and why the need is is critical for the student to receive the funding we also have programs that are last dollar programs. And that means that they're, they're going to be the first thing reduced no matter where the funds come through, unless there's an emergency. So again, we need to have that really clearly stated so that we can make sure that your other aid stays intact while we try to address the emergency that you have and not just swap out one fund for another and that doesn't really help you do anything. Yeah, we are at Q&A time. There's a question um, about, you know, given the timeline for CARES funding and how many applications are getting submitted, students want to ensure that when they craft their application that it has a good chance of funding and states their case very clearly. Where could a person go to get assistance and advice on um, how to position their situation and make sure that they have enough detail to, as they apply for CARES Act funding? Um, there is an email address that is fcares, fcares, fcovid, I'm sorry, um, fcovid19 um, at umich.edu, and they are positioned to answer questions. To kind of generally answer that question, your narrative needs to 
tie your need for assistance to a COVID related disruption. So um, if you are unable to um, complete, oh, you know what, Tiffany, I'm sorry, it's F COVID-19 APP. I had to look it up um, at umich.edu. Um, we need to understand why what you're asking for is related to COVID because we have to tie that in for the CARES funding. So if, for example, you need a computer, it can't be because you need a computer, almost all of our students do, but because you're unable to cover the cost of a computer um, and you need it for remote learning due to COVID, um, or I'm unable to pay for this computer repair because I couldn't find a job this summer because the jobs that I do were all canceled due to COVID. Those, those types of things, tying your narrative back to a COVID disruption you do not want to be asking for things for your family because we cannot support your family through that. So make sure that everything that you ask is related to you. And then in the itemized area that you clearly define what the item is on an individual basis. So don't lump um, living expenses under one item and then give us a dollar amount because living expenses is too broad. Is that rent? Is that food? Is that internet? List those individually so that we know what we can and cannot cover for you. And then don't submit it in a hurry. Um, create the application, save it on your computer, and then take a break and come back and look at it again, just to make sure that you're not forgetting something and you don't say, oh shoot, I should have submitted that I needed to buy a webcam and I forgot to put that on there. Um, so that you have as comprehensive a, um, an application as possible. Yeah, now COVID has affected us in many different ways. Um, you mentioned a few examples there. What are other typical ways that you've seen COVID, COVID applying to living expenses and emergencies of students um, through the CARES Act funding? Sure, we've had parents lose jobs. We've had students lose jobs or, or had internships canceled or unable to find employment. We have had students who um, have to rent in two places to pay because they had sublet a prior apartment and now the person who was going to sublet that can't pay for it because they were un, unable to be here due to COVID. Um, we have had students who themselves have contracted COVID and who have been in, unable to work. Um, circumstances, yes, mostly loss of income, um, which is not something you can recover. You have to tell us what the expense is. So I can't pay my rent because I lost my job um, or my parents lost my job. Um, layoffs, so it's, it primarily is surrounding either income, loss of employment, being ill themselves, or needing technology due to a remote learning environment. And childcare costs are eligible for CARES funding. I just saw that pop up, so I thought I'd answer it. Um, if it is unlicensed care, Licensed care should go through the standard child care subsidy program. Unlicensed care should go through CARES. Vicki, do you want to and say is, a word too uh, about wait. how some of the applications are coming out blank so they submit it right the first time? Oh, thank you, yes. Um, so some people are not familiar with how to download and then upload through a portal. You want to down, click on the application and download it. Save it to your computer under a new name. Complete it and save it so that you have all the changes saved to your computer. And then upload that newly named document back through your portal. Um, some students are downloading it, answering the questions, and then uploading it. And really all they're uploading is the blank application again. So we have to reach back out and then you kind of get pushed back in the queue. Yeah, we have a question about maximum amount students can be awarded from the CARES Act. Um, maximum amounts are, are lumped into categories. So we do have maximum amounts for rent, food. Um, those are based on cost of attendance, dollar amounts that we, we looked at. We have a $500 technology limit, $1,200 on child care subsidies. Um, the maximum total grant that a student can receive is $2,500. 
and that was just to make sure 2,500 and that was just to make sure that we could award as many students as possible who have needs um, rather than spending it on 50, the first 15 students who came in. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm doing a last call right now for questions from uh, attendees. We'll give everyone a few more minutes to get their questions out. Um, any other comments you would like to make um, as we're in this two minute waiting period? I can make a comment. <laughs> um, uh, for students who are listening, uh, for staff or faculty who might be listening, um, you'll never meet a more compassionate group of people than those who are administering em emergency funds and those in financial aid. They truly do have the heart of students in mind and want to see every student academically succeed and make it to graduation. So, you know, this is, they are your advocates, they're on your side. Um, and I can't express that enough that um, regardless of the office that you go to, you'll be treated with care and kindness and confidentiality. Um, and everyone who does this is, is committed to that. And I gave enough time for another question to come through. Uh, so the question is, if all of your need is not met by the CARES Act, how would you suggest recommend going to other institutions, departments to supplement the rest of your need? So, um, a lot of that's going to depend on your school and college or department because we are all operating under some limited funding and many of us cannot provide funding to you if you've already received some funding from another resource. So I would say go to your department and then ask if they're able to assist you if you have already received assistance elsewhere. The, the reality, unfortunately, may be that the full deed that you have expressed through your CARES application may not be able to be met. And I would just add to that, um, you know, if you've received care fundings, that doesn't necessarily make you ineligible for Rackham emergency funds. However, we would not, if you submitted an application to CARES for a webcam, then don't come to Rackham for a webcam. So we're not going to fund um, duplicate items that you've already received funding from other resources. But you know, if you you know needed a couple of different items and you were able to get you know um, you know a desk because now you have to set up a home office funded through Cares, for example, um, you might come to Rackham for the chair or you know the lamp or something like that. Um, but please, if you, if you do receive funding elsewhere, please include that information in your application. Yes, yeah. And I would say the same thing, that we're willing to take a look at the whole, again, the whole picture of what's going on and see how we can best, um, you know, support, uh, support what's going on to, to the best that we can. Mm All right. Well, thank you, everybody in attendance. And uh, thank you very much to our presenters, Darlene, Doreen, and Vicki. Uh, Paul's going to close us out from the session. Thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, workshop on financial education here uh, between Rackham and CEW+. We will be coming at you with future workshops. And look for a survey uh, for all those who registered, asking you what you thought about this event, but also what other financial topics you want to see so that we can bring you this programming throughout the year. Also, for those that are interested in the Rackham 101 series, we have the next two workshops coming up um, are related to, I'm putting them in here in the chat box. Uh, we have next week, we have maintaining your health and wellness. So we're gonna be meeting with uh, representatives from different health and wellness offices across campus. And of course, at, uh, on September 25th, uh, we have a program on making your most uh, making your most of the experience as a graduate student, but specifically as an international graduate student here at Rackham. Those links are in the box. Thank you once again for coming. It is greatly appreciated. We look forward to your feedback and we will see you later. Enjoy your weekend. Take care.